Good morning. Good, morning. Uh, good to see so many people on time. It's fantastic. Well, um, thank you so much for um, coming. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I think we have a, a pretty good um, set of sessions for you today. Um, this is our third year of the world tour for the 80 Solutions team at Manage Engine. And um, every year we try to come up with new topics and new ways to try to get information to you that is going to help you when you get back to work. Really that's the goal. Um, what we do is we try to take questions, trends, things that are going on in organizations, things that are going on like attacks that are going on, and we try to create sessions and topics that you can actually immediately get back to the office and you can do some, some tasks with the things that we provide for you. So really this is a solution-based um, seminar. And we're actually going to have four different topics. Um, I'm going to start off and we're going to be focusing solely on security. We're going to be talking about privileged access, and we're going to be talking about passwords. Yeah, I know passwords, they've been around a long time, but really passwords are, are the entry point for many attacks. So we need to make sure we understand how passwords work, and we can increase password security if possible. And then um, after the break, um, Harry will come up and he will talk about some efficiencies in dealing with AV management, as well as talking about some SIM solutions and some use cases that we've seen around SIM and how you can leverage that. A little bit more information about me. I am the technical evangelist for the AV Solutions team. Um, what that means is I get to tour the world. Uh, this is my eighth country in three weeks. Um, so I'm, I'm surviving, yay, two hour, two hour flight delay yesterday. You know, it's one of those things where, oh, it's, a, it's an hour and 45 minute flight, it's no big deal. And you start traveling at noon and you're there at 10 p.m. So it's just, welcome to my life. Um, but I, I truly enjoy what I do. I get to meet amazing people and I love to solve problems. So, so that's really what, what I'm about. I also produce other materials. Um, and, and what I want to do is I want to point to some of those materials that you can actually take advantage of after we're done today. Um, one of them is actually our blog. And if you go to the main landing page at manageengine.com and you go to support, you'll see that we have blogs. And we have a dedicated Active Directory blog. And if you just search on Active Directory, you can find all of the different blogs that I have written. I try to write every single week on Active Directory. Where the blogs come from is, as you can imagine, in a group this size, I get questions. And often those questions turn into blogs. Because I, my thought is, if one person has the question, multiple people have that question. So the blog is designed really for you, the administrator, to get you a quick solution about something that, that might be troubling you, something that you might want to think about. It takes less than five minutes a week of your time. If it's something that interests you, you can take action. If it wasn't something that really pertained to you, it was no more than five minutes of your time. So please come out and take advantage of this. It's really designed for you. The other resource that I want to point you to is also off of our main landing page. And if you go to products, and in the lower left-hand corner, security hardening for Active Directory. Now, this was a site that was built just about two years ago. And this site was designed to basically fill a void that I found most administrators and organizations were struggling with, which was, how do I secure Active Directory? How do I secure my domain controllers and servers? It's, it's too big of a task. So what we did was we broke down all the security areas into these little blue bars. And if you go to any one of these security areas and select it, you will see that there are blogs and videos guiding you through the process of how to secure that particular area. Now we're gonna be back into this site when we start talking about privileged access because what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through a procedure of how to utilize this information. If I just give it to you, it, it is a lot of information. But if I give you a recipe on how to use the information, now it becomes extremely useful and very powerful. And in the end, you can end up with an environment that's much more secure 
and you know that it's secure. So we'll be back into this site a little bit later. Now, at the top of this page and throughout our website, you will see that there is a new dummies book. This book has only been out for about three weeks. You can actually click here and you can download your own PDF version of the dummies book. The reason the dummies book was created is it's an easy read. It's something that, that you could give to someone else, maybe your boss, maybe someone else you work with, and they could quickly read it. It's not a, it's not a long read, and it would, it's written in a format that it's easier to understand than a technical document. So it's something that hopefully will engage someone to realize how important it is to control privileged access in Active Directory and what that privileged access actually is. So that's what the book is all about. Um, and and it, it, again, it's, it's a pretty quick read. Um, I think it's 30 pages. Um, I'm the one that wrote it. And it was amazing that, that how much stuff can't fit in 30 pages in a dummy's format. I think they ended up chopping like five or six pages of what I had written. Um, but it's, it's, it's a nice little um, thing that you can have and you can give to someone else. Finally, probably the most important resource, I think, is my email address. Please email me. I know you guys have questions. You guys have things that come up and you can't find the answer to. Um, I'm an MVP in Active Directory. I've been an MVP for 16 years, both in Active Directory and Group Policy. And the benefit for you is really two things. One, I know other MVPs which are much smarter than me, and we can tap into them. So if I don't know the answer, I, I know many other people that can get answers for us. And if we can't get the answer, I have a direct tie into Microsoft, to the product team. So please, email me with your questions, concerns, comments, and, and I'd be more than happy to transfer those into Microsoft or try to get answers for you. And, and that's truly a benefit that you have um, of, of being able to communicate with me as an MVP. So where do we go from here? Well, let's talk about privileged access. With regard to privileged access, I want to talk about privileged access as a foundation with regard to breaches. Because all of us in this room know that the majority of breaches are rooted because someone gained access to something they shouldn't have gained access to. And a privilege. Privilege doesn't mean enterprise admin. Privilege means more than what they should have. It is a privilege to be able to modify a document. That could just be a privilege. So when we look at data breaches, when we look at breaches at an organization, we have a root problem. And that root problem is other people are making decisions that maybe aren't the best decisions because it's convenient. And security is not convenient. Again, everyone in this room has gone to someone else in your organization and made a suggestion for security. And you were told, no, we're not going to do that. Maybe for money, maybe for convenience, maybe because you have to hire more people to support that, like smart cards. It doesn't matter what it is, security isn't convenient. Trust me, when I go through TSA, when I go through security checks, when I go through all this, it's not convenient. But it's security. It's trying to protect us. The same for your organization. So what we need to do, and I'm going to hopefully encourage you to do this, is where possible, take action yourself. And where you know you need to increase security, go get documentation like the Dummies book. Go get something that's going to help you prove that you need to increase security for your organization. Because the reality is today, we are being attacked successfully. So we don't have enough security. We don't. We are not secure in the places we need to be secure. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what organization you work for. It could be social media. It could be healthcare, military, government. It doesn't matter. And data breaches are on the rise. I try to go out every month or two and update this number. This number continues to rise at a growing rate. So we need to take action. And again, I'm hoping to kind of 
encourage you to go back and take some of that action, and I want to give you recipes on how to do that. Now, Microsoft is fully aware of the security issues. About a year and a half ago, I was at Microsoft Ignite. Microsoft Ignite is the, the major technical conference that Microsoft has, and they had quite a few sessions on security. So what I did is I went in and I took the graphics because I thought they were very enlightening. And they're enlightening for a couple of reasons. One is, these graphics are not from a third party talking about Microsoft. These graphics are Microsoft talking about Microsoft. So this is their own internal view of security and their products. Now, this particular graphic is talking about breaches. And there's a bunch of numbers up there. It's a $500 billion problem. Each breach is $4 million, and it goes on. But I want you to focus on the number right in the middle. 146 days. According to Microsoft, this is the amount of time that an attacker is in your organization after a breach before you know it. That's five months. What could you do to an organization in five months if you want to do something negative? Five months. And again, this is not Gartner talking about this. This is Microsoft talking about their own environment. So the reality is we are being breached and we don't know it. I think it's Mark Rusinovich that constantly says, you know, the, the question isn't if you have been breached, you know, it, it, or when you're going to be breached, it's you probably already breached. And you, have you ever heard the term assume breach? That's a Microsoft term. Microsoft coined that term. Now, they coined the term for a marketing gimmick for you to go to Azure, but it's amazing that Microsoft said assume breach. And they're telling you to assume breach because you have a different mentality now. If you have already been breached, you're going to take a different approach to security than if you haven't been breached. And you hear this from people in your organization, if your organization hasn't been breached. You go in and say, we need to increase security here. Ah, we're okay, we haven't been breached. Anyone heard that before? Okay. But of course, as soon as you're breached, what happens? Look at that poor Equifax guy. Did you hear about that? One guy was blamed for Equifax. Do you really believe that one person is responsible for the breach at Equifax? Do you notice that his name was not mentioned? Or her name? Thank goodness, right? Could you imagine that poor IT person? But it wasn't one person's responsibility. It was an entire team. It was a decision. The decision was, we haven't been breached. We're not going to patch. Now, we don't want to get into patching, really, do we? I mean, no one likes to patch because patching breaks things, right? So what do we do? We wait. We wait, and we, we, we have that balance time of, we're going to wait to this point to see if it breaks someone else's environment, but that time frame is that time frame for the breach, correct? So we're all susceptible to this, but we need to take action. We, we have to come up with philosophies, methodologies that are going to increase our security. Now, the next slide, again, is a Microsoft slide, probably my favorite of all of them that I saw. This is a timeline. According to Microsoft, their timeline of a breach. The green represents an undetermined amount of time. This is when the attacker is doing recon work on your organization. They're going to your company's website, Facebook page. They're going to the executive's Facebook page and, and social media. They're doing anything and everything to try to determine information about your network and people that work there. Then they attack with this information. Once the first host is compromised, right there, first host compromised, according to Microsoft, it takes two days to get domain admin credentials in Active Directory. Two days. 
Does that trouble anyone? It troubled me. That's why I'm showing you the slide. Once they're in as a domain admin, they're there for five months before you know it. And we wonder why data is leaving our organization. It's no question. I mean, every time there's a new attack and, and I watch some news media talk about the reasons why, I just laugh because they have no clue the reality. The reality is we, we have too much on our plate. I mean, if I were to just envision this right now, I want you to go back to your office and I want you to start working immediately on securing Active Directory. Where do you begin? I, I mean, if you could have done it already, you would. It's just the abyss. Some of you have 50 servers. Some of you have 500 servers. Some of you have thousands of servers. Where do you begin? So this makes sense to me because we have a lot to do, and it's complicated. But it doesn't have to be complicated. I really feel that security doesn't have to be complicated. And we really have to look at the full picture. For example, let's talk about that first host. What do you think that first host is? Do you think it's a domain controller? Think it's a server? Do you think it's one of your end users' desktops? Yep. How many times have you told the user, don't click on the attachment in the email? <laughs> and what do they do? Click. But it was about kitty cats. I had to watch it, right? It, 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 who knows what it is? But your users are going to continue to do that. So what are we going to do? How do we fix that? Well, let's talk about the endpoints. Let's talk about those desktops. We're going to get to Active Directory, but, we, but your desktops are part of Active Directory. You're controlling them with group policy. They're joined to the domain. So they're part of Active Directory, OK? So let's talk about those desktops, that first host. I'm sure that some of you, right now, allow your users to be members of their local administrators group. And you do that for a very good reason. Because there is an application installed on that desktop, and that application is poorly designed, and the application requires the user to be a local administrator. I know the problem. I used to talk about that in, in full depth. But do you know there is software to solve that? It's been out for over 10 years. It's very seasoned. It's not that expensive. I'm going to give you action items as we go through the day. This is one of them. Go research software that allows you to take the user out of local administrators and the software still runs. It exists. Please go research it. Manage Engine doesn't sell that. We do not have a product for that. Okay. But there are many products that do that. I'm encouraging you, go investigate that. Because if you can do that, again, this is Microsoft telling you, for example, 100% of all IE vulnerabilities go away. Now tell me another setting that you can make that is 100% effective. That's pretty awesome. Just taking the user out of local administrators gets you all of these benefits. And if the first host that's compromised as an endpoint, I think we should be addressing the endpoints. And Microsoft is seconding that. They're saying we need to address these endpoints. We need to secure the endpoints. We can't control the users. All of us in here know that if we didn't have users, our job would be a lot easier. But we I haven't, that's one thing I've been working on for years. How do we get rid of end users? I don't know, <laughs> right? So we have to work with them. We have to teach them. We, ha we, we have to build their computers so they can be successful. I'm going to put that on us. That's our responsibility. And as soon as you put that user in the local administrators group, you are deciding. Now, you're not you specifically. Someone is deciding that it's more convenient to do that than secure it. Which is why I'm saying we need to take action. We need to take action with this. Now, Microsoft has attempted to design security technologies 
to fix many of these things, to, to help us be successful. So this was a, a, a slide that Microsoft presented talking about all their security technologies. But I want to focus right over here. Notice it says privileged identities. And we want to manage them. Excellent. Let's focus on that. There are two technologies. At the top of the list. Just in time, JIT. And just enough administrative access, GIA. According to Microsoft, according to the Active Directory team, the security team at Microsoft, these two technologies are the flagship security technologies for you so you can secure privileged access and active directory. <clears throat> now before you even saw these on the slide, how many of you have heard of these two technologies? It's quite a few. That's a pretty, that's a pretty big number. In Milan on Tuesday, zero hands. Yesterday, one. Okay. Those of you that raised your hand, how many of you have implemented this? I have one fully, fully implemented JIT and GIA. Some of them. Only multi-factor. Only multi-factor. Full-blown JIT and GIA. Uh, some of our systems. Some of your systems. Okay. Excellent. This is, this is huge. In the last three years, when I've asked this question to the groups, you know how many people, now, now let, me, let me give you the, the delay. Last year I went to 25 countries. I did over 100 presentations. This is my third year of doing this. I've asked the question in every single time. You know how many until today I've had? A total? Two. So you guys just blew it out of the water. Okay? But JIT and GIA comes with some issues. Because we do have a high percentage compared to other, but these are the two flagship security technologies for privileged access. And most of you haven't even heard of them. And they've been out for four years. This isn't new. This is a four-year-old technology. Now, why haven't we heard about it? Why aren't we, uh, why isn't everyone raising their hand? Well, there are some issues. There, there are some gotchas. Here is the core requirement, the very first bullet. You must have a bastion force. So here's what that means. If this is your current active directory environment, I don't, it doesn't matter what you have. You can have multiple domains, multiple forests. This is what you administer today. In order for you to implement JIT and GIA like Microsoft is suggesting, you must install another forest in addition to what you have. Okay? This becomes your bastion administrative forest. Those of you that raise your hands, do you have this? So you don't have this. Do you have this? This? So I only have really one person that's implemented JIT and GM fully. Because you need this. Because this becomes your entry point into administration. And the way it works is you come over here and you take your administrative groups and you empty them, correct? And then you come over here and you create mappings of the groups that map over there. So at no time is anyone in the group. Pretty good security, huh? But then you create rules in PowerShell. Ugh. Rules in PowerShell that someone over here can run a command and add their account into a group here. That group matches over there. Then I come over here and I perform the task. That is full-blown JIT and GIA. If you want to see this live, which I encourage all of you to do, another action item, Go to our security hardening site, and right here, I have a link to a live demonstration from Microsoft on the technology. Go watch it. Because I think what you're going to realize is, oof, this is, this is complicated. This is big. This is going to require a tremendous amount of, of work and money and effort to get this in place. Was it a little bit of work for you to get JIT and G in place? Uh, not really, because we are in the process of doing it. Oh, you're in the process of doing it. So you're not quite done yet, but you're getting there. Yeah, pretty far. Yeah, but it didn't take five minutes, though, did it? No. Yeah. <laughs> it's been working for uh, one and a half years now. One and a half years. 
we are about uh, 10 resources worth of one and a half years. <laughs> okay? I don't even know if I'll be doing this in one and a half years. I don't know what I'll be doing in a year and a half from now. I mean, I want a solution in like a couple months. And, and there are some other, what I would consider to be kind of bumps in the road with JIT and GIA. Okay? And remember, JIT and GIA is so that you can get control over privileged access. That's what it's about. And in the video, you gotta go watch this video. It's, it's actually, it's, it's, it's very informative, let's say that. In the video, it's live, everything's live. And again, the way that you get privileges is you come to this forest and you run a PowerShell command. And in order to leverage that, because this is a different forest than that forest, you must come to this forest and do a run as the user over there. So we get to use the run as. What's interesting is in the, de the demo that I'm asking you to go watch, the gentleman adds himself to the group and then continues to talk and he's talking about the details and he talks and he talks for about seven or eight minutes. And then he comes over here and tries to do the run as and it fails. Because over there, you have the option to set what's called a time to live. How long are you going to be in the group? He said it for five minutes and he spoke for seven. So by the time he actually implemented it, he was already down to the group. What's the lesson there? How many of you, when you sit down to do a task, you actually get the task done in the time frame that you think you're going to get done in? <laughs> exactly. So, what are you going to end up setting the time to live to be? Eight hours. Eight hours? Really? You only work eight hours? Yeah. I want your job. <laughs> Everyone in here wants your job. What are you going to end up? I mean, if, if you're going to remote in in the middle of the night to solve a problem and you have to all of a sudden go run PowerShell in this other force, do you, you really want to do that? Or do you just want all the time to have privileges? Isn't that what you had over there to begin with? So now you have privileges over here and you just doubled your problem. I think instead of looking at this, maybe at first, just look at solving privileged access. In this, don't double your problem, just look at it here. Because it's possible. It's absolutely possible to do it over here. That's exactly what this website is about. This website is all about doing that. This website is dedicated for you to fix this and maintain this. And you're gonna do it in five steps. Five steps. Every security setting has five steps. And they're all the same five steps. That's kind of nice. The first step is reporting. If you don't know what you have, you can't fix it. So you have to report to know what you have. Two, once you get a report of what you have, you have to determine if it's what you want, what you need. You have to analyze. Report and then analyze. You have to analyze what the security setting should be. Three, you're going to configure what it should be. Now, if you just do those three steps, report, analyze, and configure, and then you walk away, how soon could that setting change? Could it change almost instantaneously after you set it? So what do you want to know about that setting? What do you think step four and five are? What do you want to know about the setting you just set? Yeah. If it stays what you set it at? If it changes, right? Mm -hmm. You want to monitor changes. Now, how many of you like to look at reports? <laughs> you just love reports. How many of you actually would rather have an email telling you it changed? That's called alerting. Now, it, it sounds simple. Ah, it sounds simple. It's revolutionary. And we're going to walk through three privileged access areas showing you how to do this. It is not difficult. I truly believe if you use the five steps and you use that security hardening site, working a little bit every week on this, in less than a month, you can secure all the areas in here and be alerting them. Super simple. Okay? Let's talk about privileged users. Talk about privileged users. Now, privileged users, we have a lot of them. 
Because we have the administrator account. How many administrator accounts do you have? A lot. Every desktop, every server has a local administrator account. We've got to secure them. These are the entry points for the attacks. Remember that slide, the breach? Now, this is where we have to take a little bit of responsibility. Because we created the problem. Do you guys remember back, remember back when, quite a while ago, when you used to have to install 10 new computers, you'd take the first one out of the box, and you would install the software, and you'd take the second one out of the box, and you'd install it. Remember those days? And then, like, overnight, the software came out called Ghost. Oh, it was fantastic. It revolutionized everything. So now what we did is we took one computer, we installed the software, we hacked the registry, did all the security settings, we did every, it's the perfect computer. It's the gold image, right? And then when you have two new computers, what do you do? Bink, 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 done. They're all perfect. But what's the local administrator password on all those machines? <laughs> the same. Is that a problem? Well, not for you. You wanted it that way, right? But is it a problem in terms of an attack? Is there an attack today against this configuration in a Microsoft world? Probably more than one. Well, what's the flagship one? Pass the hash. You guys have heard of this, right? Have you guys secured for pass the hash? You should. Go to www.microsoft.com forward slash PTH. There are a couple of white papers that Microsoft wrote on how to reduce the effectiveness of pass the hash. They're actually very, very good. Very easy to read, very easy to implement. Great ideas. At the end, though, you can't stop it. You cannot stop pass the hash. All you can do is reduce the effectiveness. But if I come into that first host that's compromised, remember the timeline, and I get the local administrator password, how many desktops now do I have access to? All of them. How long does it take me to get domain admin credentials? Two days. We're responsible for that. We're logging in everywhere as an administrator. That administrator account hash, the password hash, is stored in the LSASS. As soon as I get local administrator, I go in and I pull them all out and I climb up the tree. Two days. Two days to get domain admins. Stop using the same local administrator password on all your desktops. There's a software for that. Microsoft has it. It's free. It's called LAPS, L-A-P-S. Install it. Use it. They've given it to you to fix the problem. I don't think security has to be tough. I just think we have to take action. And we have to take action where the attackers are coming in and infiltrating our networks. And we all agree it was the first host was a desktop. Then secure your desktops. Don't use the same local administrator password, and don't put users in the local administrators you are going to see an immediate increase in security. But we also have to talk about Active Directory, right? I mean, we have an administrator there in Active Directory that seems to be quite important. So we need to secure that one, too. Now, I'm going to guess that some of you did not install the Active Directory environment that you're responsible for today. So I'm going to give you another action item. I want you to get back to the office and verify if the administrator has been renamed. Okay? We, we, we need to rename administrator. <laughs> I have an administrator account here. How do I determine if I've renamed it? Meaning, how do I know this is the original? What's unique about a user that I can verify if it's the original? That's it. That's how you do it. Perfect. So we go in, administrator, attribute editor, there's my object SID. Have I renamed it? Yeah. How do I know? Should be, uh, can't remember, is it 500? 500. Do you know that every administrator account installed on any Windows machine ever ends in 500? Hmm. All of them. All of them. It doesn't end in 500, so I've renamed it. Excellent. Step one. Now, what have I renamed it to? Huh. 
Wouldn't it be great if I could go to Active Directory users and computers and actually run reports? Like, give me a report of all users and their SIDs? Or does that exist? Let's see. Um, report, no. Um, no. Doesn't exist. So when we start looking at the five steps on all the security settings, step one can sometimes be a hurdle. Mm. Right? So you are going to need tools to help you with this. Now, I'm certain that some of you are preparing for GDPR. Right? Now, how many of you have dealt with auditors for compliance regulations in the past? Okay, there's a lot of hands that aren't raised. Warning for those of you who didn't raise your hands. <laughs> They're coming. Those of you that raise your hands, do auditors ask for the most ridiculous reports in the world and you have no idea why they're asking for them? Look at their head shaking. You see that? This is what you're up against. They're going to want a report of users and their SIDS. And you're going to go, why? And they're going to go, because I asked for it. Do it. Okay. And you have to do it. So you're going to need tools to generate reports. Now, there's many ways to do this. But what I'm saying is, you want a tool that's going to be easy. Watch how easy this is. AD reports, user reports. All users generate. There's a list of my users and their SIDs. I don't think there's many other tools that can generate this quick. Oh, if you want other columns and attributes, we'll just come in here and look at the full list. Add or remove what you want. All right? Now, what we're looking for is we're looking for 500. Right here, 500. What did I rename it to? James Bond. So now I know that I've renamed administrator to James Bond, and then I created a new account called administrator. What level of privilege do you think the new administrator account has? <coughs> Nothing. Does this benefit me in any way as an administrator? No, really, really. Okay, so hire me, and I'm just gonna start pounding on James, um, um, James Bond. Just, just to start trying to log on as James Bond. I'm gonna try to, as the person next to me doesn't understand James Bond ends at 500, and they're gonna try to log on as administrator. Are you tracking this today? Do you think you have employees that are trying to hack in as administrator today? If you don't, <laughs> they're there. I want you to set it up. Go set it up. Go set up this honeypot and then track failed logons. If you were sitting here right now and your phone vibrated and you got an email that said that someone failed to log on as James Bond, would that be a concern to you? So I think this does benefit you, doesn't it? It tells you when you're under attack. It's just simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. I want to be able to know through a report, through an alert, when someone fails to log on as a particular user. I want to be able to go to log on failures. I want to be able to go into history. I want to be able to go here and say, okay, over the last five months, I want to know all the failed logons for all the users and be able to generate a report for that. Okay. I want to be able to search on particular users. I want to be able to get the information. Every single report that you see here on the left, every single one of them can have an alert associated with it. Meaning, you set it up, you say I want to be alerted, and you get an email when that happens. You can even do thresholds. So let's say you're, I don't care if someone does it once or twice, but if someone fails to log on as James Bond three times in a minute, you're going to get an email. You're under attack. Today, how would you ever get this information? Because tracking failed logons is easy, right? That's actually very easy. I just set up auditing on all my domain controllers, and the end result shows up here in Event Viewer. Probably one of the most powerful, worthless tools that Microsoft ever built. <laughs> right? It is powerful. All the information goes there. I have 131,000 events 
How in the world am I going to know when administrator James Bond fails to log on? Is there reporting in here? No, nope. doesn't exist. Is there alerting? Yeah, there is. There is alerting. You can actually get an email. When any user in your organization fails to log on, you're going to get an email. How many emails do you think you're going to get at 8 o'clock in the morning on Monday? You're probably, going to, you're probably going to have a denial of service attack on your own network. Right? Because I can't get down to the individual user. I can only get to the failed logons. The tool just doesn't provide that. That's why you need tools to work with the event viewer. And that's exactly what AD Audit does. All AD Audit Plus does is it goes in, pulls out the events from Event Viewer across all of your domain <laughs> controllers, and allows you to report and alert on it. That's, it's that simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be complicated. You just have to have the right tools in place, and you have to know what to do. Okay? Now, let's move on. And let's talk about our second particular privileged account, which are groups. Because as we've seen with users, if we, aren't, if we aren't watching, we don't know what's going on. We just don't know. And I'm going to guess that most of you in here really don't know what's happening back at the office. Because you don't have a learning set. I mean, when you guys go to a conference, this is just a, a half-day seminar. This isn't as bad. When you guys go to a two-, three-, four-day conference, how many of you dread going back to the office? Because you're going to have problems, right? And who's the person that can solve the problem? You are. So what you do? What do you do? You go back to the office, and you're like, okay, we have this problem. It's been here for two days. All right, two days ago, um, it appears that this, this, and this happened. Who made that configuration? Did anyone change anything? And you're asking your team, did anyone change anything? What's the answer you always get? <laughs> me? You, are you accusing me of changing? No, I didn't change anything. Okay, the, the, I call it the internet elf came down and made the change and then left. It just happened. Computers just change all the time on their own. No. What you need is you need solutions that allow you to go in, go to a quick setting and say, all right, I want to know all the changes that occurred in the last 24 hours. Every AD change. You guys know how to look at this stuff. You can quickly go through and look at a change and go, that's it right there. But if you don't have the list, how do you know? Well, you guys were taught to troubleshoot computers and active record. And you go and you start at the beginning, don't you? You always start at the beginning and you work your way out. Why? Why not just get an email telling you that it changed? If it was a good change, great. If it wasn't a good change, I mean, if, if, if some of you have this set up right now, and your phone vibrates and it's like, oh my gosh, that happened, I would encourage you to step outside and take care of the problem. But if you don't get the email, how do you know to take care of the problem? You don't. Now, most of our privileges for users are granted through group membership. So we have to take a look at group membership for privileged groups. But if I were to ask you to go back to the office and quickly develop a list of all the privileged groups in Active Directory, that's a tough task. But I've been asked to do this. When I go into audits, and people hate me as an auditor, trust me, they hate me as an auditor. And I go in and I say, we've got to know all the privileged groups. So I've come up with three categories of groups that will help you track your privileged groups. Right? Category one. Category one in Active Directory, your privileged groups are default. We all have them. When you install Active Directory, you get them. But you want to document these. You want to write them all down. Okay? So, of course, we have domain admins, administrators, all the way through account and backup operators. If you have four domains, how many instances of these groups will you have? Four. They're unique per domain. Right? Now, we also have other groups that are default that aren't at the domain level. Those would be 
are forest level groups. Right? So at the forest level, we have schema admins and enterprise admins. One per forest. Now let's talk a little bit about these groups. Schema admins. If I have membership in the schema admins that allows me to administer the schema, yeah, not a trick question, <laughs> those are coming, right? it allows me to modify the schema. How often do you modify your schema? Who should be in the schema admins on a daily basis? No one. It should be empty. Perfect. Enterprise admins. Pretty powerful group, huh? Is there any more powerful group? This is it. This is, this is the top, the most powerful group in Active Directory. Let's say that you have four domains in a force. And you have the ability through one or more accounts to administer all four of those domains. Does that make you an enterprise admin? No. No. There are tasks that an enterprise admin can do that a normal domain admin can't. For example, adding a domain to the forest is an enterprise admin task. Modifying an Active Directory site is an enterprise admin task. How often do you do that? So, rarely. rarely. Who should be an enterprise admin on a daily basis? No one. No one. But do you notice that I didn't get the no one with enterprise admins like I did schema admins? Because some of you are sitting there thinking, well, wait a minute. I should be an enterprise admin, right? <laughs> And I don't disagree, but all I'm saying is don't do it on a daily basis. Don't have your account be an enterprise admin every single day. Now, I want you to think about clearing out the enterprise admins. Okay, today, enterprise admins is now cleared out. Okay, we analyzed, we, we configured it to be empty. Now you're monitoring and alerting. You know it's empty. You know it's empty. No one can do anything as an enterprise admin. And you get an alert that says someone's added to enterprise admin. Does that get your attention now? <clears throat> ah, it all matters on what it was in the configuration, didn't it? The five steps work, I'm telling you. The five steps work. If you go through the five steps, you're going to be able to determine what things should be, and you know they're correct until you're told different. It changes the way you administer Active Directory. Okay? So, group, category one of privileged groups, default. Category two, application and service groups. These are groups that are placed into Active Directory when you install an enterprise application or service. Exchange, for example. SQL, for example. SharePoint, for example. You need to go through all Enterprise applications that you have, you're, have to, you're going to have to go to the website of whatever you installed, and on that website somewhere, that will document the groups they put into Active Directory. Document them. This will take a little bit of time. Okay? But you must know. I mean, for example, if right now, back at the office, the CEO is added to the Exchange Admins group, is that a concern for you? Yeah, but if you don't know what happened, you know, you, you have to document them so we can track them. Third category of privileged group, custom. But you deal with these all the time. These are typically the groups that you deal with most of the time. Someone created a group and then added it to another group and they administer this or vice versa. So this is the groups that you deal with all the time. Document them though. We have to have a list of all groups that have privileges. Again, this doesn't have to be domain admin privilege. If I have the ability to modify in some way your HR database, is that a privilege? Yeah, that's a privilege. So we need to look at all the different groups that have privileges throughout your enterprise and document them. Okay? Now that we have them documented, we're going to go through five steps. Step one is reporting. All we have to do is get a list of all the users in the group. So we go to Active Directory. We go to the first group on our list. We go to members. 
and we take a screen capture and we're done. Right? Hmm? What? 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 Why? Because we've got sub users in those groups. Oh, I have I have groups in the groups. Does anyone else have groups and groups? Does anyone have groups and groups and groups? <laughs> groups and groups and groups and groups and groups and groups and yeah. Yeah, lots of, lots of nesting of groups, right? How long have we had this problem? Forever. Now, if everyone has the problem, and we've had the problem forever, it just makes sense that inside of Active Directory users and computers, I can hit a button and get a list of all users recursively. Can someone tell me how to do that? <laughs> no, inside of the tool that we all use. What? <laughs> well, this is, isn't this Microsoft's Active Directory Administrator tool? Yeah. I, Probably would never use that in like that. Uh, yeah. Well, a lot of people still do. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they've had to move away. Why? Because Microsoft never added the option. Okay? So, after years, back to Windows NT, we've had this problem. And still today, we don't have a solution through a GUI. But of course, if I call Microsoft and say, hey, do you have an option for getting users recursively in a group? They'd say, PowerShell. Excellent. So I learned about this. This was a couple years ago. I'm like, I didn't know this existed. Now, I am not a developer. Not. You're going to see that pretty quickly. And so I said, well, I'm going to do this on my own. This is, and this is exactly what happened. Okay. I had, of course, knew about PowerShell, so I said, I'm going to go into PowerShell. Now, let's get an idea of, of the knowledge of PowerShell here. Let's say from 1 to 10, 1 is, you can spell PowerShell. <laughs> Not correctly, but maybe spell it. Um, and then 10 is, you are awesome at Power. You, you and Jeffrey Snover are like this, right? <laughs> How many of you feel like you're a 4 or above? It's the biggest number I've ever had, okay? Biggest number I've ever had. But it's still not even 50%. You know how long PowerShell's been around? So 2006. I believe that's almost 12 years, okay? What is the most important technology to Microsoft today across the board? PowerShell. Hmm, we have a mismatch here, don't we? Right? So I'm going to encourage those of you that didn't raise your hand I want you to get to be about a three or four. I do. You don't have to be the guru, but you have to be familiar with it because there are some things that you have to do in PowerShell. All right? So let's talk about some core things. What is the most important command in PowerShell? There's one command that's the most important command. Get help. See, every, I hear that every time. Right? So the idea with get help is, you just type a word. We're talking about group membership, so group. Huh. We have information. This says groups objects that contain the same value. What? This isn't what I want. I want I want group membership recursively. So of course I went to the authority on PowerShell, Google, and um, <laughs> and it told me that I was using the wrong version of PowerShell. I said, I didn't know there were multiple versions. Some of you may not know there are multiple versions of PowerShell. They're actual modules. So I went out and I downloaded the Active Directory module for PowerShell. Those of you that do not have this, action item. As soon as you get back to the office, you need this. Because you don't need it later. You need it now. Because if you need to solve something, you need it already installed and ready to go. And I want you to play with it. Just play with it. This is going to get you to a level two or three, okay? You need to understand syntax, you need to understand all the everything. It's a programming language, right? PowerShell is a development language. That's what it is, okay? Microsoft is making it seem, they're trying to make it seem like more than that. It's all it is. So you have to get familiar with it. So, of course, I had learned that the most important command is get help. Group. Huh. This is exactly what happened. I'm like, well, this is not useful at all. I thought there would actually be more commands in here. So, of course, I went back to the authority, Google, and 
um, it said that I wasn't searching on the right group. You know, I'm not searching on the right group. It said you actually have to search on a D group, which totally blew me away because I'm thinking, how in the world would I know that? That just doesn't make any sense at all. But when I search on AD group, it actually gives me all these commands. Now, what's amazing about this is right after this occurred, right after the whole group issue and recursive, I had gone um, about a month later up to Microsoft for the MVP Summit. The MVP Summit is where MVPs around the world go to Redmond, Washington, and we have a little conference. And we hear about things that we can't talk about, and we just try to further the technologies, all this stuff. So of course, at any conference, you have socials, right? So I go to the social, I grab a beer, and I'm, I'm walking around, and the first other MVP I meet is a PowerShell MVP. I'm like, well, this is a great opportunity. I had just experienced an issue. I would like to tell this MVP about it, and maybe he can go and try to fix the issue. Because I think this is a bug. This is truly a bug, okay? So we were talking, and I said, hey, you know, I, I, I have something for you. He goes, what? And I said, well, I heard about this group recursive thing, so I, I went into PowerShell, and I, I typed this, and he goes, oh, you weren't using the right version. I said, I know. I went to Google, and it told me I was using the wrong version. So I went into the right version, and I did, I did get help group, and it gave me the same result. And he said, and I quote, no, it didn't. <laughs> I said, yeah, it did. And we went back and forth like 10 times. He was certain it would give me a list of all of the commands that had the word group in it in anywhere in the description. But it doesn't. So the lesson here is, for those of you that aren't familiar with PowerShell, it's going to be frustrating. Because it's just a development language. And it's, it's not going to be perfect. It's not. And it gets frustrating. Okay? But even when you can get to get... Now, let me show you this. Git help group. Oh, no, nope, AD group. Notice it's not even Git AD group. It's Git AD group member. Which that's why you need to do the Git help to know which command you need to run. So if I do Git AD group member administrators recursive, it gets me this, which is what I want. I being you, the administrator. But <laughs> you aren't the one that asks for the information. Who asks for the information? The auditor. Are you going to give that to the auditor? <laughs> no, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Those of you that raised your hand to deal with auditors, how many of you love your time with the auditor? <laughs> hey, we're consultants. <laughs> well, you're consultants. Excellent. That's different, though, right? For those of you that just want the auditor out of your hair because you actually want to get work done, it becomes a little frustrating, right? Because if you give that report to the auditor and they leave, what's going to happen? They're going to come back. And they're going to ask for another report. So you actually have to give them information <coughs> that they can use, that they can understand. They're not going to understand that. I guarantee it. So you have an option. You can go and format everything in PowerShell, <coughs> trying to get them what they want, or you can use a tool that's actually designed to do this out of the box. AD reports, group reports, group members, I want the details, administrators, users, generate, there's my list, export PDF, done. Yes, you can do it in PowerShell, but guess what? I have a bicycle outside, and I have two big pieces of luggage. I can also get to the airport from here on my bike. Doesn't mean I'm going to. Do you know that it took over five years for Microsoft to develop the AD module for PowerShell? PowerShell was not designed to administer Active Directory. It wasn't. It was an afterthought. It was a complete afterthought. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. Yes, it shows you can get through and persevere and deal with PowerShell, okay? But there's more efficient ways to do it. What I want you to do is I want you to take these types of reports and automate them. 
inside of a tool that's designed to generate PDFs. Now think about this, those of you that deal with auditors. If you could every single week generate a report for group members of all the groups they always ask for members for, dump it into a folder where the auditor has access and you tell them where it is, wouldn't that save a lot of time for you? Yeah. It's easy to do here. Click, 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 done. Automate it. Just generate the darn thing. Have it available in a PDF. Have it available in such a way that it's easy for everyone that's involved. Because that's really what we want. We want the end result to be easy. So now that we have this idea of finally getting the report, we're only at step one. We're at reporting, okay? Now we're going to analyze and we're going to configure. Now, how many of you in here right now, with 100% confidence, know the members of your domain admins group? Before you raise your hand, here's the rules. There is someone else back at the office right now that can modify the group members. And they just did. They just modified domain admins. How many of you right now have 100% confidence of domain admins members? I got two. How, how many of you feel you need to know the members of domain admins on a second by second basis? <laughs> of course, all of us. Why don't you have it? Oh, I know. Because you've set up auditing, and auditing goes in here. Right? I mean, even if I wanted to search in here, right? I got this powerful find option. Right? Let's go find domain admins. Just cancel. <laughs> You've done this before. Yeah. <laughs> right? This is only 100. I actually have a pretty small security log. Yeah. This is only on one DC. How many DCs do you have? Because guess what? You get to do this on all of them. Because your goal is to find out when domain admins change last. Because that's the only way to know, right? I mean, unless you have a report of what the changes are, you're going to have to go through the logs coming up with a report on your own. So instead of taking this approach, what I'm going to suggest is you take advantage. All the information goes through here. It does. All the information goes through the security log because you set up auditing. But if you have a tool that you can go in here and go click, reports, my reports, <coughs> modified admin groups, I want to know not in the last 24 hours, in the last six months. And there they all are. And then if I just want to search for domain admins, you will see that my domain admins was last changed on October 12th. Pretty powerful information. Your auditor is going to ask for this ridiculous type of report. And if you don't have a tool that's monitoring, you're in trouble. Now, yesterday I actually did a small session on GDPR. And here's something I want you to realize with GDPR. GDPR requires you to monitor. Monitor the access to personal data. Personal data is what you're trying to protect. If you have an administrator that's on the ACL, but any administrator can add themselves to an ACL, correct? Right? So if you have an administrator account that can modify group membership or the ACL, you're going to have to generate a report of who's been added or removed from that group. That's a report you need to have. How are you going to do it with Event Viewer? Because guess what? If you don't have the report, you're not monitoring, you just broke the law and you're going to get fined. It's just the way it is. According to GDPR, that's what's going to happen. Now, I think there's going to be a little leniency up front because we really don't know what the auditor is going to ask for. But if I extrapolate what I've just seen in the United States with HIPAA and Sarbanes-Oxley and, and Graham Leach and PCI and everything else, these are the information, this is the type of information that auditors are asking for. 
Because you have to monitor access, you need to be able to generate a report of changes to these privileged groups. What I'm saying is just automate it. You actually have the report before the auditor gets there. Here, reports, done. I don't want you to have to work at this. I want it to be automatically just generated and things are good to go. Okay. Now, the way that this works also is I want an alert. So I told you before, every single report can have an alert associated with it. And here's where the alert comes in. If someone goes into Active Directory in any way, it doesn't matter. If, if a group has changed, it doesn't matter how it initiated, PowerShell, VB, a script of some other kind, a tool, it doesn't matter. As soon as a group changes membership, a privileged group, such as schema admins, what you want, right, as soon as I hit OK, watch this. See how fast I can get over there. OK, here, home. I already have an alert. Your phone is vibrating right now, telling you that that group changed membership. This is what you need. I truly feel that a tool like AD Audit Plus has two primary functions. One is for the auditor. Generate reports. Just set them up, tell them where they are, and let them go. But the second one is for you. Because you can't see changes that are occurring in Active Directory. It's nearly impossible. Without a tool telling you of the change, how do you know? So things are happening in the background in Active Directory. Many different things. OUs are changing. GPOs are changing. Who are my group policy administrators? Who administers group policy? Uh, aren't they tough sometimes? Aren't you concerned someone's going to go in and make a oops? I mean, it's pretty easy, right? I mean, group policy, the abyss, is what I call it. I mean, let's just go down here to this. Pick a setting, any setting. Let's see. I want that one. Right? I'm just going to go and change that. I'm going to go to one of your GPOs and I'm going to randomly click one setting. Good luck finding it. Right? That setting could destroy every computer in Active Directory and make it not function. Don't you want to know these changes? Again, that's not a privileged access, but then again, it's just a change in Active Directory that you need to be aware of, that you're not today. You need to get an email saying, whoa, there was a setting change in that group policy object, and here's the setting, here's the old value and the new value. You may want to go investigate that. That's possible, because all of that goes through the security law. You just have to have a tool that can grab it, parse it, and tell you that it happened. Those are the kind of things that's possible. And you have to know this. And those of you who have been dealing with group policy, it's extremely complex. And it's very difficult to know what's happening. With over 5,000 settings in a single GPO, without customization, it's complicated. And then you start customizing, it just gets even more complicated. So we have to have mechanisms in place that is going to help us get through this, okay? So the whole idea is that you document the three categories of privileged groups. Once you've documented them, then you go into a tool like AD Audit Plus, you go to configuration, there is already a group modification report for admin groups. But am I aware of all the services you have installed? No idea. I have no idea. So I need to edit this and just add in. You'll notice that I have groups in here that I've added based on the three categories. That's it. The other thing that I would do, I would create another report solely for GDPR groups. The groups that have access to your GDPR data, you create a report and an alert if any of those groups change. Now, when that auditor comes in, you can show them the report. This is the report of all the groups that have access to GDPR data, and this is the history of the last year of all the changes. That's impressive. That is something the auditor can use. 
Not really useful for you, but it's great for them. You just want to make sure it's correct. That's where the alert comes in. Because you've made sure it was configured, and until you receive the email, it's still configured correctly. That's the power of the five steps. Okay? So those are groups. Those are how we go through the five steps with groups and make sure that we are securing them. Our final privileged access. Service accounts. How important are service accounts for you and your organization? Yeah, we just set up one service account. With for all of them? Yeah, for all of them, we make that member of domain admins, everything works. <laughs> now, you said you're a contractor, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's the contractor's <laughs> approach. <laughs> yeah. I, saw this, I saw this at a client. Yeah. They had, I think... Was it administrator? Was it the built-in administrator account? It's actually that too. And uh, no, it's just domain admins. <laughs> yeah. I think he needs to be older. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, well, no, he comes in and does the work, and then the person behind has the audit. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but but service accounts are a pain. They're they're a royal pain, and they're even more of a pain when you're audited. <clears throat> because those of you that have been audited, this is how this process goes. The auditor comes in and they ask you for a listing of all Active Directory users and key properties. The last time they logged on, the last time they changed the password, all of these properties. If the password is required to be changed, all those things, right? You give them the report, they leave, and you hope they don't come back. But they do, right? And they come back, and they have a piece of paper in their hand, and it's a list of users. And they show up at your door, and they're like, um, I just analyzed the users that you gave me, and I noticed that there are quite a few users that haven't had their password changed this one in five years, and you're, you know exactly it's service accounts. So you say, oh yeah, all those are service accounts, hoping that's enough to make them leave. But it's not. Because then they say, well, we have compliance regulations that we must meet, and the compliance regulation says that all users in Active Directory must reset their password every 90 days. And these aren't meeting compliance. Sound familiar to some of you? Okay. Because those of you that it doesn't sound familiar, this is the way it's going to be come May 2018. This is exactly what's going to happen. Because every single database that contains GDPR data, there's a service account, and that service account is going to be ridiculed in this way. All right? So then they ask you the question that no administrator likes to hear. Why haven't you changed <laughs> the password for these accounts? You have to give them an answer that will make them leave, <laughs> right? So I ask this around the world, and I get the same answer. When an auditor asks you why you can't change that password, you tell them? Because. Because what will happen? Fuck some reasons. We don't know what will happen. It, what? What will happen? <laughs> we don't want to say, I won't repeat what he said. It'll, it'll break, right? Yeah. It'll break the service. Well, the auditor says, oh, well, we can't have a setting that breaks something. Okay, bye. They leave. All right, you hope they leave. But what's the real answer? Why can't you reset the password? It means extra work. It means extra work. You think you can tell the auditor, yeah, I don't want to do that, it's extra work. <laughs> yeah, that won't go over well. But another part of that is, do you really know where the service account is configured? Oops. So that's the that's the ERP guys who installs all that stuff, and their documentation is even worse than the system guys. Ah. Okay. So yes. you're passing the buck. See, he is a he is a contract. He just passes the buck. He just blames someone else. Perfect, right? And your and in your favorite phrase is, it depends. That's that's always a good one, right? So, this is an issue, and I know it's an issue. I mean, I've been dealing with auditors now for, for 20 years. So, when I came to Manage Engine, I actually went to the development team, because we have this amazing free toolkit, and I said, can we add a tool to the toolkit? And 
I was shocked. We did. <laughs> Within like three months, we had this tool right here, Service Account Management. This is part of our Active Directory free toolkit. You can download it right from our main landing page. Service Account Management, Service Accounts. You pick all of your Windows servers. Once you've picked all your servers, you go get service accounts. And it will go using the credentials, and it will come back with all the service accounts for all the servers that you picked. Now, what you're going to see is the list actually lists some that are kind of built in, and we don't care about those. So we give you a filter to just get the users. If you want to know the associated services, we can get you that too. But now you have documentation of all the Windows machines, their services, and the users being used for those services. Excellent for documentation, but again, I'm more concerned about your day in and day out activity. What I want you to do is I want you to be able to leverage this information so that you can actually benefit from it. Because today, if someone were to go into Active Directory, go to Service Account, and they were to disable Service Account, how are you notified that that occurred? Well, next time the server moves, something breaks. Okay, but, but how do you know that? I mean, you don't, you're usually not monitoring the server. How, how are you notified that something broke? The phone starts ringing. And who's on the other end? Ah, uh, users. <laughs> Does anyone get up in the morning and say, gosh, I hope I get to talk to many, many users today? <laughs> no one has that thought, right? Because this is how that conversation goes. You pick up the phone and they're like, yeah, it's broken. You're like, who is this? They're like, it's Bob in finance. Well, hi, Bob. What's broken? The application. Okay, Bob, which application? The one on my desktop. Sound familiar? I mean, the poor user has no clue. I mean, it's, it was working, now it's not working, I'm calling you, telling you. But do you have any idea that someone disabled the account? Nope. I mean, it could be a problem with the NIC. It could be a problem with the router. Who knows what the problem is? You have no idea. But if you can document all of your service accounts, you can have a report for all the service accounts Right? So if I have a report here for when my service account is modified, this is a custom report. Super simple to set up. User, this is not there by default, but all I did is I gave it a name. I said user modification. I added on all my users from the free tool. And then I said, if anything changes, I want to know. Done. That's how simple it was. So now what happens is if someone does go into Active Directory, they do anything to a service account, I am notified in real time. You will get an email of the change. You can fix it before anyone even knows. That's the power of reporting and alerting. You have to be able to do that. You have to be able to monitor what's changing. You have to be notified of what's going on. No one in here has time to go and look at reports of changes. You have to be told. You're all attached to your phones. You guys all are looking at emails. It's going to come through. You have to be notified of this. These are things that you can do. And if you take these five steps, not just with privileged accounts, but you take these five steps and you actually apply them to all of these things in the list, this is how we increase security of this environment. And again, reporting isn't always easy. It's not always easy. It sounds easy, but it's not always easy. In through here, I have a, each, there is at least one blog that tells you how to report on that particular area. <coughs> Guiding you through that process. Helping you get to the point where you're being alerted. <coughs> but just imagine for a minute that all those security areas you know at one point they were configured correctly. And you have an alert for all of them. If you haven't received an email, don't you have very good confidence that they're still configured properly? That's the point. That's the point. 
So I don't think you need to install this other environment. I just think you need to secure and manage this environment. And these are the steps that you can do to do that. Now, another area in that list is related to passwords. So what I want to do is I want to walk through some different concerns about passwords. Yes, I know passwords have been around for literally ever. But you would be amazed, still today, 18 years after Active Directory was released, almost 18 years, still today I find administrators don't know how to properly report on the domain password policy. Still today. So, when you leave, you all know how to report correctly on the domain password policy because it's going to be required for GDPR. Some of you have to generate it today for other compliance regulations. But this is certainly one of those reports that your auditors are going to ask for. So, if you go into Group Policy Management, which should be here, and you go to the default domain policy, <coughs> settings, security settings, password policy, and if you take a screenshot of that and give it to the auditor, I want you to stop doing that. Because <coughs> it's worthless. It it's, 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 doesn't tell me anything about the domain password policy. This is a report of a file that's in the GPO. That's all this is. It's just telling you what's in the GPO. You have zero confidence at this point that that group policy object is actually configuring your domain controllers for the domain password policy. Now, if it's a brand new install, sure, I can go here and do this. I don't think any of you have a brand new install of Active Directory. Some of you have come into the environment and you really don't even know what you have. But there is a built-in command that you can utilize. It's built into every Windows machine so you don't have to install anything that tells you the true security settings on that machine. So if you go to one domain controller per domain and you run secpol, secpol.msc, stands for security policy, and this tells you what the current configuration is. So if I go to my account policies, Password policy. The lower right hand corner is what is actually configured. And up above is what the report said. Do we have a problem? We have a major problem. So if you look at the five steps, and if step one is wrong, what does that mean around the next steps? They're wrong too. You're, you're analyzing wrong information. You have to generate the correct report to know what the security is. And if we go back to how we started, I really think this whole solution of JIT and GIA doesn't really help me overall. Yes, it, it helps me with some issues, but we still have a variety of other issues. If you take the five steps and implement them, now we have good, solid security. And if things are changing, I can be notified of that. So this is where we need to start. Now, remember step two, analyze. Well, the analysis of some configurations isn't always easy. I think this is one of them. Let's first of all talk about the scope of a domain password policy being pushed out by group policy. How many password policies can I have in the same domain using group policy? One. I can have one. Anyone that thinks different, it's one. <laughs> All right? It's one. Trust me. I've tested every possible permutation to get it to be more than one, and it's one. One size fits all. Does that really work for you? Not really. But it looks like it, right? This is what I often get. Oh, no, Derek, it's possible. If I go into group policy, and I come in here, and I create a new GPO called the finance password policy, and I go into that GPO, and I edit the security settings, 
and I go to the account policy and I say, oh, I want a minimum password length of 14, what is going to be the minimum password length for all users? Whatever the other one said, secpol. This does not work. Do you know why it doesn't work? Yes, this is only for the local users on that server that's where this policy is being applied. I'm going to be very specific. It's actually not related to users at all. This setting, well, first of all, how, what two types of objects in Active Directory can receive settings? Computer and user. What type of setting is this? This is a computer setting. So this will actually affect the computers that are in that OU. It's a computer setting. It's like, what is a computer setting? You, you passwords, that doesn't make any sense. I call it a filter. It's a filter on the database that resides on that machine. For local machines, which you're exactly correct, the users on the local machine in that database now have to adhere to the filter that's on the database that's affecting that machine. So this is a computer setting, not a user setting. But does Microsoft give us any technologies so that we can have my multiple password policies in the same domain? Yep. Yep. And do I configure those through group policy? Nope. <laughs> Add C edit. Right? And inside of Add C edit, I actually have a nice web-based tool. So mm -hmm. For which operating system? 2012 R2. Yep, 2012 R2. If you have 2012 R2, you now have a GUI. How long did it take? <clears throat> Only about seven years. That's not bad for Microsoft, right? At least you have a GUI now. So down here, the password settings container, if you don't have 2012 R2 as your domain controller, you get to use this. These are fine-grained password policies. They have the exact same controls as a normal password policy and group policy, meaning the settings that we had here, right? All of these settings, they're the same settings in fine grained password policy. They didn't add any more. All they did is they gave you the opportunity to say, okay, everyone on this side of the room, you get, um, you have to have. 10 character passwords and using complexity. Everyone on this side, you have to have 14 character passwords in complexity. I can just have multiple password policies. And they're associated to groups, not even OUs, groups. So now you have to specify certain groups. And then you have to go into the setting here and you have to modify the PSO applies. So you now have to modify a, a particular attribute of the object so that it applies. It actually gets pretty complicated, and it's, it's almost impossible to audit. So again, when you get to the audit, and someone says, um, what's your password policy? And then you say, well, we have fine grained password policies. Oh, great. Can you show me that? <laughs> yeah. Good luck, right? But again, you, if you get a tool that can do this, it actually doesn't become that difficult. So I can go in and get a list of users, and I can add in this thing called PSO applies to. Right? PSO apply. Password setting object apply. Now here's the way password policy works. If I only have a group policy object, then everyone gets the same, and it's going to be a dash. If I give this side of the room a fine-grained password policy, and I put all of you in a group, whichever fine-grained password policy you're getting will show up in the list. So if it's a dash, I know it's the default, or it's the generic GPO-based password policy. Otherwise, it's in the list. It's a fantastic way for you to actually know who's getting what GPO or password policy. Without something like this, it becomes very difficult. And you're responsible for generating this report. So if you have fine-grained password policies, you need to have some way of telling the auditor who has what, because they're going to want to know what that is. Now, when we start looking at the details of our password policy, let's go back here. So if I go in here to the default, let's just talk about some of the, what Microsoft has set, right? These settings have been here since Windows Server 2003 SP1. 
They've been the exact same settings. Do you know what they were before SP1 in 2003? No password required. That was pretty good security. That was only 15 years ago that Microsoft didn't require a password in Active Directory. Now they require these settings. How good are these settings? In today's attack technologies, how good are these settings? They're not good at all. If you don't believe me, I want you to go add another action item to your list. Go to our main web page, go to products, go to this identity password management. Underneath there, you will have documents, white papers, and I wrote a white paper early this year on password cracking. Inside of the white paper is a link to another white paper from the NTT group. The NTT group deals almost primarily with identity management and passwords. And in their white paper, they describe how they built a $20,000 server to hack passwords. I saw the presentation in RSA a couple of years ago, and I went up to the gentleman that gave the presentation. I said, oh, this is extremely interesting to me, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I think I use a pretty good password. What do you think your, your server could do? He actually had a spreadsheet. He put in my password and goes, I can break that in 20 hours. Amazing. It's all described in the white paper. So if you want to see what the current technology is for breaking into passwords, I think that's the current most impressive thing that I've ever seen describing it. It actually details all the research they did to come up with the heuristics around breaking into passwords and their hashes. I said, well, what about past the hash? He goes, we can break into password hashes faster than we can actually exploit past the hash. That's impressive. So what do we need to do? We need to defend against hacking of password hashes. So what do we need to look at? Well, I think we need to go look at tools such as Clean up here, Kane. Because Kane is probably one of the most current password hacking tools that are out there because it has a built in password cracking tool. The very first option dictionary attack. This is an attack dictionary, right? This isn't like Webster's dictionary. This isn't like some normal dictionary. This is an attack dictionary. If you wanted to take the attack dictionary from here that an attacker is using to break into passwords, could you put that somewhere in Active Directory using Microsoft technology such that users can't use a word in that dictionary? No, can't do it. Wouldn't that be nice? Doesn't that just make sense? Microsoft knows about this. They could do it. They just don't. But imagine, similar to our taking users out of local administrators, we could eliminate that entire attack just by putting the dictionary inside of Active Directory and not allowing users to use words in that dictionary. Brute force attacks, right? Brute force attacks require that the attacker put in the character space that they are going to use to attack because it's going to go through every permutation of those characters that they choose. So the more characters, the longer it takes to crack the passwords, right? So what does the attacker want to do here? Reduce the character space. How do they do that? Well, let's go back to our password policy here. And it says that we have complexity requirements. Well, what does complexity requirements mean? Well, Microsoft finally added in <laughs> some descriptions a couple of iterations ago. So if we come in here to complexity requirements, it explains that this requires three of the following four categories. And what are the four categories? Lowercase alpha, uppercase alpha, number, and special. Your users have to do this, right? You have to use three of the four. Which three do they use? The first three. The first three. Do you know I get that answer around the world? The exact same answer. So what does that mean? Users aren't using special characters. Because it's too difficult. If they were up there in that top row and I got to do a shift, I don't know. Right? 
So if I'm the attacker using Kane, what, what am I going to choose here for character space? Lowercase, uppercase, number. Why would I use special when not many people are using them? Okay? So, let's see. If we want to increase security, what should we force our users to do? Use all four. Use all four. Is there a Microsoft check that says use all four? Can I force a user to use special characters? Doesn't exist. Yes? I was just wondering, isn't this solvable easier by the lockout policy? The lockout policy? Yeah. Well, this has to do with cracking into the password. Yeah, but if you have a lockout policy and you lock out the policy and you, 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 you try it five times. No, 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 no. This is not trying anything. Okay. This is actually getting a hold. So let me take two steps back. So the question is, if I set the lockout policy, doesn't that help with this? No, because this right here is a dump of the Active Directory database. I'm actually not trying to log on. I actually have the hash. I'm breaking into the hash. So what, the, what Kane does is it gets the hash and then goes through all these permutations, creating hashes, comparing them to the hash. Because Microsoft doesn't salt their hashes. So if I can get the hash that matches and I know what created that, I know what the password is. That's what Kane does. So what we want to do is reduce this. Because if you go read the NTT group white paper, this is exactly what they did. They're, they're cracking into the hash Determining what the password is. Isn't this solving Windows 10, I think? No. The security option to encrypt your password hash in memory? Uh, that may be in memory, but that's not salting the hash. In Active Directory, it's not salted. Okay. So if I pull it directly from Active Directory, it's not salted. But you have to have physical or virtual access to Active Directory. You, you, you have to have access. Yep. Yeah. It, like PW Dump can do it remotely. Okay? So. What I need to do is I need to enforce this, but I can't force all four characters. So th this becomes a problem. And we realized the problem, and we said, well, gosh, we have a tool that deals with passwords. Why don't we just add something called an enforcer and give someone the ability to add a dictionary? Click, add a dictionary. Click, require special characters. Also in the NTT group white paper, they described patterns and how they looked at patterns that most users use. They looked at the Rock U attack. Rock U had three billion, no, three million accounts and everyone did research on them to look at patterns for users. That's why we added patterns in here. So the idea is that we now can increase the password policy that you have in place. This works with whatever you have, whatever you have. It just sits on top and enhances it. And if you only have group policy base, which is one size fits all, we can give you multiple because we have policies inside of AD Cell Service Plus. So now in, I can say, over here, you have a certain password policy, you have a certain password policy, and you now have password policies that increase security across everyone, and now it's completely customizable. These are solutions that we have to put in place. These are things that are a requirement that we need to have in place to reduce the attacks, because we're getting attacked and getting attacked successfully. Okay? Yes? We're using the Cell Service Plus. Uh, um, so if you set the setting to, for example, 14 letters and you use all four, um, mm -hmm. um, what does the user meet, uh, meet when? when he tries to log on with a failed password, does he meet the, the windows? Uh, it's not fulfilling the company's, uh, or is he meeting uh, So the one of the things that you can do inside of AD Cell Service Plus is you can actually give the user feedback. So, uh oh, my client. <clears throat> Houston, we have an issue. I have been hacked. There we go. Uh, no, it's still gonna. So there's an option inside that allows you to um, basically give the end user what the password policy is. 
So at the logon, they can see what the password policy is. When they're changing the password, all those we can actually display what the password policy rules are. And when they fail, it tells them which ones is incorrect. It's fantastic. Yeah, there's some settings in there. We, we can look at those. Okay. So in these first two sessions, we talked all about security. Privileged access and passwords. Both of them we must approach in a different way. If you follow the five steps, you can actually get to a point where you know what you have, and with alerts, you know if they've changed. And we must take action on our passwords. Please go read that white paper. It's a very interesting read with regard to passwords and hacking and what's possible. Because it's brand, it's not brand new, but newer technology, newer concepts around breaking into them. Okay?